This interview is brought to you by Burn It Up Coaching and the 21 Day Transformation. And if you're someone who has been hiding out or you're not self satisfied with your, your results, you've been self sabotaging, making excuses, playing the victim, or you just know that there's more capacity, more potential within you, you are destined for greatness, and you want a supercharge, you don't want it to take nine months or three years, you want it to take 21 days, you want to transform your life in 21 days, then the 21 day transformation is for you where it'll be hands-on coaching one-on-one -on -one coaching calls supercharge daily checking in to make sure that you are on fire mastering the habits holding yourself accountable and really working through that past limiting beliefs limiting paradigm that is keeping you from succeeding and being crystal clear on your goals creating that clarity and certainty as you execute on a daily basis and knowing that you got Chris Burns lighting a fire under your butt every single day to make sure that you're on track that's what the 20 one day transformation is all about if you're interested in that send me a message on facebook would love to get you more information about it fill out an application see if you're a good fit for the transformation and keep up the heat so the next part of this is the itunes review of the week and it's from 17th try I loved this insight. I've heard people say things like, don't wait until you're ready. You'll never be ready. I loved your twist on that. If you'll never be ready, you'll also never be not ready. Your energy is powerful. I look forward to hearing more episodes of your show. Thank you, 17th Try. And for everyone out there who's listening, you're listening right now, we love it when you leave us a review. Let us know how we're doing, how is the show impacting your life. You could do that at beyourgps.com forward slash iTunes and let us know. We'd love to hear and keep having the best day ever. It was Devin Galladay's job to take his father's ashes and pour them into the waters of Cadiz, Spain after his death. Carrying his father across Spain by car, train, and backpack, this was their swan song, their buddy picture come to life. Half a mile from the Mediterranean, Devin lost his father's ashes. Standing in the middle of a windy cobblestone street in Old Town Cadiz, he wondered, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> Not just in that moment, but the 40 years prior. This is a wild-eyed history of secret family stories that include 50 stolen cars, cars, sacred African fertility dolls, a Darth Vader mask-wearing junkie, a Vegas hooker with one impressive breast, a hero's journey, and traveling across the world with a black jug that contained his father in a rolling suitcase. A wickedly funny memoir that is part adventure and part tender reminiscence. 10,000 miles with my dead father's ashes will make you laugh, cry, cringe, and yearn for your own Spanish adventure. It is in bookstores September 18th, 2018, or visit http forward slash devingalladay.com forward slash dad for more. And we are so blessed to have Devin on the call on this interview today. Devin, are you ready to rock this? to rock this that sounds like a great book chris i, <laughs> I know I, I wish i could talk to the person who wrote it i mean shoot <laughs> anyway it's good to see you how are you dude amazing amazing and just life is staying blessed D definitely challenges right you know kind of like mm -hmm. losing your father's ashes you, know, you just like have no idea what you're gonna do next i, I have some of those moments every now and then <laughs> yeah no i i think we i think we all do um <laughs> But anyway, it's good to hear. It's good to be here. Thank you Thank for you. for uh, uh, you know making this moment happen. I was listening and so impressed mm. of I mean just the fact that you do this with such enthusiasm mm. for twelve hours is. <laughs> I, I'm almost ready for a nap now, and I've been out here for about forty seconds. So, so I am I am truly impressed by what you do and how you do Thank it. You. Thank you, Devin. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I received the acknowledgement, and we're gonna dive in today to this this concept of you know going balls to the wall. Twelve out. No, I'm just kidding. We're diving diving into the freedom to choose. That's that's the theme of today. That's how we're gonna start off this interview. So, Devin, how does this concept of freedom to choose? How has it impacted your life, and how is it important for you? Well, I mean, I think that's all there is at some mm. point. I mean, I think it's probably the most uh, powerful magic that we possess as as people. And, mm. you know, we have 
Uh, don't get me wrong. Like, I think there are things like I think we're supposed to meant to, I think we're supposed to uh, have experiences that are challenging. I think we're mm -hmm. supposed to have difficulties in our lives. Uh, and I think we're supposed to have things to overcome. Mm -hmm. uh, but the power to choose is, I think, one of our greatest gifts. I've accomplished things in my life. Uh, you know, really, I failed my way to success. Mm. Um, but part of it is is the choice to keep trying. Okay, we'll try it one more time. We'll try to do this thing. You know, um, I, by the way, I'm grateful that you read sort of the uh, uh, the synopsis of my book, mm -hmm. which is, you know, I mean, talk about the power of choice. That mm -hmm. book took me seven years to write because wow. I had to keep choosing to write it. And I, you know, it was, uh, it, I, I think there's a lot of wonderful things. I think ultimately people who, who read the book will get something out of it, but that wasn't something that was like, oh, I, I'm going to take a, a few hours now and I'm going to choose to write this book. It was, you know, crossing emotional thresholds that I didn't think I was capable of crossing. Wow. And it was about choosing to continue to write over and over and over again, even though my natural instinct would be like, you know, it's time to give up. <laughs> I, I'm gonna. I, I think I'm gonna buy a sack of cookies, eat those, and then take a nap for the next nine years. You know. Um, so I think that's what we have. Was that mm. was is that really the? That's the long answer, I suppose. That's great. That's great. That was perfect. It's it's the choice to continue facing the adversity, facing the challenge as you grow, as you feel this yearning, this pulling in your heart, your soul to get this message out, to get this this memoir out, to get this this work of art out to people who who can be benefited by it, by inspiring them, by sharing that wisdom. I think that's perfect, man. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think that's. But we all have that power. Like yes. I don't think I'm. I don't think I'm sort of some sort of unique, special person in that end. I mean, mm. I think we have a life of series of things to overcome and to push mm. through. And you know, I like the word fortitude, mm. where you just have to kind of. There, there's a certain uh, amount of just buckling down and knowing that it's going to be a trial by fire, knowing that it is going to tax you and test you every step of the way. Mm. And I think, uh, you know, certainly for the writers out there, that's going to be true, whether you're writing a short story or a poem or, mm. you know, a feature length book, it's it's you're going to have to face that. And, and if you're not sort of a creative person, you're going to be tested in the same kinds of ways, mm -hmm. whether it be your, your job or your family life or your children. There's going to be a thing and probably mm. many of them. So we might as well start getting used to the idea that we have, I think, more control over moving forward in our lives to get the things that we want than we don't. So since we're here and I do want to dive back into your journey and we'll do that in a second, but I'm curious, like, what do you see as different before you went through lots of challenges and hardships and difficulty? What was your perspective back then? And what is your perspective on challenges and obstacles now? You've shared a little bit about it, but can you give us a little bit more of the contrast that you've seen as you grew through the last couple of decades? Yeah, um, I'm a big crybaby. That's mm. the truth of the matter is I think <laughs> I think for my young adulthood, I, I believe that there was a magic pill. There mm. was, well, if I did this one thing, then the universe would turn off all of the challenges of my life. Mm. And I think I grew up with sort of the, the belief system that once you got it right, all of the difficulty or all of my feelings about stuff would just kind of dry up and blow away. And I think it has much more like, what would I say now? is that um, I know of I know that life is intended to be what life is intended to be that you know I, I get to accept life just as it is mm. and the things and don't get me wrong I have crazy amounts of blessings um, and I think in my 20s I didn't see any of the blessings mm. I was oblivious to the things that were really positive in my life and I chose to find, you know, if I was going to be speaking somewhere, I chose to find the one guy who looked like he was falling to sleep to focus my attention. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it was my job to wake up that one guy <laughs> and ignore the other people in the room that were actually paying attention and were engaged. Wow. And so now it's a conscious effort in my part. Like that's part of the choosing. Mm. Part of the choosing is I get to frame it 
from, oh, I'm, I'm, there's this one person I'm not reaching to, you know, I have the opportunity to engage with the people who are right in front of me, mm. you know, and I think that's, I think it's a, an across the board kind of thing. Like, mm. you know, I have this wonderful woman in my life. I'm married to her mm. and I am grateful and I don't have to worry about the million billion other women that, mm. well, maybe there's this thing, you know what I mean? Like some sort of a, an, a notion of perfection, mm. And I could worry about that, or I could be really grateful for what I have and turn my efforts towards being a good husband, a good father, a good son, a good citizen of the world to be kind to strangers and, you know, help little old ladies across the street under the belief system that some of them actually want my help. You know what I mean? (laughs) But I get to go out into the world and and participate in that thing rather than get too mired in the things that I'm not getting, you know, the the things that I'm afraid of losing, the afraid of the things that I'm not getting as opposed to kind of taking stock in the the good fortunes that I have. Wow. That's beautiful, man. That's beautiful. I I hear a lot of gratitude, a lot of appreciation, a lot of acceptance and allowing kind of, you know, that, that just super, super detached in a way that like the universe is going to happen how it's going to happen. And Hey, I'm here. Let's, let's ride the wave. Let's ride the wave. <laughs> yeah. Well, and here's the thing when I was, and I don't know what, if, if it's true for you or your audience, but when mm-hmm. I was 11, mm-hmm. I decided that um, really my goal in life was to play first base with the Los Angeles Dodgers. Mm-hmm. And then as I got older, I discovered that, uh, there's no five foot eight first basemans in ever anywhere. <laughs> and then I discovered that not being able to hit a curveball or a fastball or a slow ball would also impact my ability to do this. But what I've come to understand is that like I had to mourn that loss at some point. You know what I mean? Like as a teenager, teenager I just had to accept this was – This was not going to be my path, even though I really wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. And what I understand now is that looking back, I ended up getting a lot of things I didn't even know that I wanted Hmm. because I because I was I didn't have, you know, like the best I could do as 11 years old was want to be the first baseman for the Dodgers. I had no idea the rest of the world that would be out there waiting for me. Mm -hmm. I I had no idea of of the of the really the wonderful things that were going to show up in my life that, by the way, showed up. And at the time, they looked like it was some really bad, terrible, uncomfortable thing until I got to the other side of that thing. Wow. Wow. Powerful. Powerful. So let's, let's go back to some of those challenging moments, the, the wisdom that you gained, the, the trying times the, the, where you felt like breaking down. And yes, you're a crybaby now, but like you really were crying. <laughs> really yeah, no, no, that, yeah, no. I, I think I'm less of a crybaby now, but at the time – you know, when I was in my early 20s, I just assumed that the world had to be going against me mm. and that there would be some thing that would just unlock mm. the door to give me all the stuff that I felt that it was that I wanted. Mm. What were you what were you doing in your 20s? What were some of those the, the objectives that you had and the challenges that you faced? If I'm honest with you, I think my main objectives was trying to uh, make uh, drinking beer as a, a vocation as a mm. spiritual process. I, I thought that uh, if the right woman mm. would say yes, and that would be to everything, saying yes mm. to a date or sleeping with me or whatever, mm. all of those yeses would somehow validate me as a man. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I, I guess, I guess I'm speaking in some generalities here, but, you know, when I look back at it, it's like, was that specific, you know, with the specific women in my life, right or wrong? Well, the, the answer was, is that they were necessary. Mm. So I got to learn about what it was to be a man and to learn that, you know, that external thing wasn't going to validate me as a person, that if mm. I wanted self-esteem, I had to actually go take esteemable action. Mm. You know, I had to do the things that uh, in my heart really resonated with me. So I was chasing, I was chasing after money. Mm. You know, I was, I was chasing after money. I was, I was chasing after, I remember uh, going to, or not going to, I remember not going to my senior prom in high school. Hmm. And 
you know, really, I ended up asking the most beautiful girl in school. And I had saved up this money so I could buy a tux and rent a a limousine and go out with the most beautiful girl. And I figured, well, if if she says no, which she did, Mm -hmm. um, I would buy this bass guitar. And, you know, the bass guitar was with me for like 35 years. Wow. And I don't even remember this, the beautiful woman's name. But at the time, it was just this kind of moral, emotional defeat that I wasn't good enough and that mm. if she somehow said yes. And ironically, at the same time, uh, a guy that I had grown up with since like kindergarten mm. did in fact ask out like the second most beautiful girl in school. Mm. And she did say yes. And they went to the prom and they had the worst time ever. Like he like talked about it for years. This was utter misery. <laughs> so her beauty and the fact that she was on his side wearing his corsage mm. was not the thing. Mm-mm. It wasn't, it wasn't the answer to whatever it was that he was hoping to get, mm. you know? Uh-huh. So, I mean, these are, you know, there's just a million of those kinds of things of me not getting what it is that I want or not measuring up to whatever fantastical sense of what, what I was supposed to do. You know, these mm. expectations of myself where I was just constantly failing. In my brain, right. in my brain. Like, I think looking back, it was not that. I was just, I was learning how to be a man. I was learning how to, to be a grown up. And, you know, I think, I think the new sort of hip word is adulting, that we're all sort of terrified. <laughs> Is that yes. is that the, is that what the kids are saying these Adult, days? I, I think that might be out of style by now. <laughs> oh, oh and, and by the way, how dare you? I just wanted to... <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. No, but it's, I, I get it. And I think that those those challenges that we think are the end of the world are really just put there as as a way to grow through, as a way to, like you said, fortify our character, what it means to be a man, or if, if there's women listening, you know, what it means to be a woman as you grow through these challenges. So how did you start getting into the, the travel direction in your life? When did that happen? How did that become a, a, a thing for you? Wow, I don't know how much time do we have, but I'll try to I'll try to keep it I'll try to keep it condensed. Basically, um, I love travel. I was sort of a, a backpacker, a rucksacker at heart, of mm-hmm. one of my more favorite words. Mm-hmm. And I remember going to Iceland, mm-hmm. and and sorry, I'll like I said, this may be a I love it. I'll try yeah. to I'll try to keep it keep it tiny. Mm-hmm. And so I before I left, I wrote 175 Icelanders. And at the time, hmm. you could find an Icelander because all of their email extensions were was dot is. Hmm. So I looked up all the dot is on I don't even think there was Google at the time, but I wrote all of these people. And the story was, hi, I'm coming to your country. I don't know why, even though I was telling all of my friends that I wanted to scream naked on a fjord. Um, but <laughs> I, I said, I'm coming to your country. I don't know why. And I would love to know what your favorite restaurant is or what natural thing I should see in your country or a great restaurant or a great mm-hmm. bar or a great movie theater or a great anything. And I don't mm-hmm. want anything from you. Um, and if, if you don't have a recommendation, please write me back and wish me good luck because it would mean a lot to me. Mm. I got one response. <laughs> And so I went to Iceland. I met the one person. Uh-huh. Um, we didn't spend a ton of time together, but she was she was really a lovely person. And she was a uh, a philanthropist, a web designer, a mm. poet, a, just a multi talented person. But here's the thing: after I came back from this trip, she would write me these letters, and literally would have like ten URLs on them of all of her projects. Wow. And like she would say, oh, I'm going to write a comedy album. And two weeks later, I'm in the studio recording my comedy album. You know, three weeks after that, it would be, I'm distributing my comedy album. She wasn't funny. But the point was that she was constantly in motion and taking yeah. action. And it was this remarkable thing. And so mm-hmm. she sent me she sent me a note and I was disgusted. You know, I, at the time I would have said, oh, she's just a snob. But really, she was just going after what it was that she wanted. Yeah. And I attached a little story that I had written and attached it to um, a, uh, uh, an email and I sent it to her. And mm-hmm. she wrote back and said, didn't you see the third link from the bottom where we're putting, 
out a collection of poems and short stories in sort of response to 9-11. I can't guarantee you that it will be, you know, that it be printed, but I can make sure that it gets read. Hmm. And so I promised myself I'm going to write this story. And so I wrote a little story. It wasn't the best story in the history of the world. <laughs> but three months later, I got a note back from an Italian publisher who said, you're on page 52 and the Dalai Lama's on page 106. And this was, un this was like crack. <laughs> you know, I haven't I haven't done crack, but this was this would have been like a crack moment. Where I was like, I want more of whatever that thing is. Wow! And so I called up everybody I knew, and said, um, "Do you know an editor? I want to. I'm a writer. I want mm. to be a writer. That's because mm. that's actually I would not have said I'm a writer. I would have said <laughs> I want to write or I mm. want to be a writer. And I finally got in touch with a travel editor, and I said. Uh, I want to write for you. And he goes, well, I, I don't need you. Every, everybody wants to write for me. I said, I understand that. But one day you'll be in a bind. And if you are, think of me. And he goes, well, mm. I won't. Thank you. Um, <laughs> good luck to you. And I said, well, I, I get that. But if you are in a bond, please think of me. <laughs> yeah, I won't. And this went back, back and forth, a, you know, a, a number of times. And uh, he called me up like a month later. He goes, hey, listen, I'm in a bind. Can you be? Oh, my uh, God. <laughs> Can you be on a plane to Mexico? Do you have a valid passport? And can you be on a plane to Mexico like on Thursday? Wow. And I said, how much will it cost me? And he chuckled. And I said, uh, it's, long story short, I was met at the airport by kind of a guy who looked like a general with three stars on his hat uh, with my name, like on one of those boards at uh -huh. the international exit. And, uh, you know, it was... Um, it was a, a miraculous, wonderful hmm. thing where um, I started travel writing. And part of it really was, uh, I think at the time, and I think this is still holds true, unfortunately, that I think most Americans don't have a passport. It's hmm. something like 30, 25 or 30 percent of Americans own a passport hmm. and travel abroad. And then, of course, there's like another 40 percent of those who don't ever ever use the passport to go anywhere. Mm. And I think there's a certain amount of just the way kind of USA number one, and and there's there's a certain amount of beauty in that. And I think mm. this is a, a wonderful and beautiful country. Mm. And mm. Uh, I think Mark Twain had said something to the effect of that if you only read one page of the book, you haven't read the book. Mm. And so to me, you travel mm. the world to mm. kind of get perspectives that you couldn't find anywhere else. That's beautiful. Beautiful. So as your career unfolded, like what, what was that like for you going to all these different places and really owning your abilities to, to, you know, write and travel and like, how did you know where to travel to or what, what inspired you the most? What called you, called to you the most? Well, I don't know if there was a specific thing that called me, you know, the most, because mm -hmm. I am without question, like I'm, I'm sort of curious by nature. And, mm -hmm. and even if I disagree with you, I kind of want to know what you think, because it's mm -hmm. just another avenue to find the thing that we're all, we're sort of all looking for that nirvana. We're all mm -hmm. looking for that stability and, and sense of purpose and contentment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you have a way to do it, let's, let's hear about it. And mm -hmm. for me, travel is one of those things that allows you to immerse yourself in somebody else's culture and mm. language and hospitality and failings. Mm. And you get to see what's working and you get to experience that in a firsthand way that, you know, that a book or a magazine article can't give you. And so um, all of a sudden I did, I found myself, I was traveling quite a bit. Mm. Um, I was traveling all over the world and I just, you know, I think there was a sense that, you know, certainly as an example, Mexico gets a lot of bad rap because the mm -hmm. only time you're really going to hear about it is if something horrible happens. <laughs> right. 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 Um, and so we have all of these kind of weird immigration things and all mm -hmm. of this discomfort about people and what they're doing and where they're coming from. And I've been to Mexico 40 times. Wow. over 40 times. I mean, I think it's a wonderful country and I've had, yes. you know, I mean, maybe, maybe a lot of good fortune, but I haven't had any, any real, um, 
you know, real problems that I couldn't have found here and mm. haven't found here a million times. Mm. So my thing had always been like, it just kept reinforcing the idea that I really believe we're supposed to know each other. And the only mm. way to do that is to go explore the other side of the world. So I've now been to uh, 85 countries, wow. uh, you know, many of those countries I've been to multiple times and seen different aspects of it. And I've seen poverty in a great many of its forms, which is, is tragic, I believe. And I certainly don't have a solution to that, but I think it's, I think it's important and imperative for us to kind of explore, uh, you know, the, the pluses, go see the, go be a tourist for a while and then go see some of the things that, that make us a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. So I get that it's important for you for us to travel the world and we see your perspective. We get the why now. And I think anyone who's listening right now is like, yeah, you know, I want to go travel. So how do we get this, this travel journey started? And especially, you know, the, the theme of this interview is like traveling for free. What, what do we have to do in, in the world to get to that point? Oh, okay. Gotcha. All right. So, <laughs> so, all right. So I started, by the way, most of the trips that I've taken over the last, um, 15, 17 years have all been funded by somebody else, mm -hmm. to be quite frank with you. So I guess maybe my experience of the travel is, you know, almost like, oh, well, look at you, you know, <laughs> but, but so what it is, is, and, and so how I started traveling for free, I started a website, right? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, wasn't, wasn't uh, the Huffington Post or some monster website. It was just me. It was just a little, it'll, you know, my in, in the no traveler .com, this little itty bitty website. I mean, it's a pretty big website now, but when I started it, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And really what I was doing was providing, and I didn't understand it at the time, is that I was providing uh, a service mm -hmm. to tourism boards, to hoteliers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, every city that is of any consequence at all has some sort of a tourism board or a uh, convention and visitors bureau or something like that. Most of your towns, even if like the only thing you're known for is like having a giant boil, a ball of tinfoil or something like that. Uh, there is a person who's selling tickets and wants you to come visit their giant ball of tinfoil. Mm. And so this is true all over the world, right? Mm -hmm. Some places you'll need quite a bit of value to provide like, you know, Paris, or Italy, like to get their attention, you're going to need to do something big. But there's a lot of other places that are just looking to get, you know, to get on somebody else's radar. So mm. because they have these wonderful people, or they have the, the wonderful food or a unique experience or, 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 or. Mm. And so really how I traveled for free was providing value. Mm. And I mostly did it like here's if I was going to give you like a, a few really good tips mm -hmm. is that you have some sort of a value that you can provide to these folks. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to have some way that you can provide it. Maybe it's a website, but maybe it's not, you know, because I traveled mostly in the beginning by trap by writing on somebody else's back, so to speak. <laughs> I was like a freelance writer for a magazine that I begged to write for. And so they were providing the value. I was providing the conduit to that value. Mm. And so these tourism boards, they have budgets that you can't even fathom. Mm. I remember having dinner with the, the Minister of Tourism from Wales who said, oh, yeah, we send six or 700 writers a year to Wales. Wales is a dot of a country. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It is a dot of a country. So when they send, when they say they're sending journalists there, they're talking mm. about sending breakfast, lunch, and dinner, flights, wow. all transportation, the whole kit and caboodle. Like it's, mm. it's remarkable and it's available. But I mean, I think the key thing here is, is that you have to know what your value is. You have mm. to know how you're going to provide that value. And I would argue at the end of the day, and you have to be clear, I can offer you X you have to be able to have that clarity, but then I would also recommend that you actually over deliver. Hmm. You give them something that is going to be valuable. You give them, you know, you give them uh, a reason to be excited. And, and again, most of the places you're going to go, surprisingly, not surprisingly to me, are going to have something great. So you don't have to go to a place and worry, well, what if I don't like the food? Well, then you're an idiot. Order more food. <laughs> or order different food. Try something unique. I, you know, I remember 
going to Greenland a number of years ago. And uh, one of the guys that was on the trip that I was on was a vegan. I have no problem. This is not suggesting veganism is a bad thing. Mm-hmm. What I'm suggesting, however, is that there's no arable land for produce mm-hmm. in Greenland. So you're, mm-hmm. going to, you're going to Greenland with no, no vegetables. <laughs> what do they do? They eat seal. But they, you know what I mean? Like they use all of the parts of the seal. We can argue whether or not that's right or wrong. But the point is, it's just what they have. They don't have a vegetable patch. They have, they go out and they hunt seal and they eat fish and they're Mm. surrounded by snow and ice. Mm. So it's not like a potpourri. Mm. So this guy went and had a bad time because all, all I can eat is lettuce. All right. Well, pick a different place. Write about something other than lettuce. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah so it's like going somewhere where it's in alignment with where we want to go is definitely i mean think about the stuff that we want to do there what we enjoy for people who hate the cold you probably don't want to go somewhere that's super cold <laughs> well either that either that or you have to reframe it you have mm. to reframe it into a place of i'm going to find the things that are, are going to be useful to my audience mm. or to the world at large or i'm going to make a statement about you know because by the way it was cold. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like it, was, it was freezing, crazy cold. Um, but at the same time, they have you could get cell reception on the, on the polar ice cap. So, I mean, there was some amazing, surprising things that were going on when I visited Greenland. So, you know, food, what, food and the color scene may not be number one, but the culture was remarkable and the people were remarkable. And the fortitude of the people who live there is remarkable. And those were things that were all eye opening for me. So I think if you are going to like, if you're like, I'm, I'm not changing my mind about the cold and I'm just going to have a miserable time. Yeah, don't go. But mm-hmm. if you can frame it into, okay, I'm going to have an adventure, good. then I will go have my, I'll go have an adventure that is worthy of my time and my exploration. Then I get to be surprised. And then I can talk, I can come from a place of truth. Mm. I can come from a place of curiosity. And I think those are things, you know, certainly from where I sit, I think is essential. I think it's important stuff. Yeah. So you mentioned that if you're a writer, I mean, that's a definitely a sure, surefire way to have a shot of getting these, this, these travels paid for and the whole adventure paid for. Is there any other types of industries or ways that you've seen um, people use these travel bureaus and tourism boards? Sure. How else can we do that? It, well, it's limited only to your imagination. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I've i done a, some, some traveling uh, with my wife where they put on weddings on our behalf. Hmm. We got married. I mean, we've been married now 20 times all over the world. We've had weddings so that awesome. would blow your mind. Yeah, no, you know a little bit about it. Yes. We've discussed it before. But it's mind-blowing stuff. I mean, we've been married in castles. We got married uh, in a recreated Latin vulgari medieval wedding where everybody was dressed up in medieval attire and uh, i was at the end of it knighted as a cavaliere di san marino which was crazy (laughs) it's totally crazy and that and that was something that we received for free Mm. you know that was a beautiful thing but because we were promoting a particular idea and they were like we love this idea about you getting married all over the world so we want to help you to do that. And it, all that was, was just a little idea that I had, but honestly, any media form will work. Uh, so if you're doing interviews or you're doing video work or you're doing photography or mm. slideshows or whatever, all of those kinds of things work. And then it might be, well, uh, I want to put together a video segment for you as an example. Uh, I want to write brochures for you. Um, you know, does and and, there's tons of bloggers that I think the new the new phrase is influencer, mm-hmm. which if I'm if I'm honest with you, I don't even know what that means. That means <laughs> I mean, I understand that it influences what or whom. I don't know. <laughs> Just sort of a generic thing. Right. But it's but that's kind of where we're at in the world. So mm. I think what that means is, is the if I if you had asked me this question 25 years ago, it would be very, very limited. I would have said photos and writing. That's it. And you have to write really well. Mm. 
Like you have to, you know what I mean? You have to really be able to do it. Now the gloves are off. I mean, you know, I'm sure you've visited blogs and the writing is atrocious mm -hmm. and it, but it doesn't matter. Right. It's sort of, it's one of those things. So like, I think, could you do what you're doing? Could you get somebody from some tourism board to do exactly what you're doing right at this moment? And you start developing a relationship with that person. And at some point there's like, oh my gosh, we need a trip for two to some hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, we would love for you to go. Can you interview the people? Mm. Can you interview the general manager of this fantastic hotel? The answer is yes. I know that for a fact because I've done it. Mm. Wow. That's amazing. And, uh, something came to mind is we have a lot of coaches and speakers on here. You could organize an event in a city that a destination event or a retreat or something like that. You know, contact these people, uh, the boards and travel bureau as a way to right. say, hey, I want to bring our business to your your area. How do how right. do we do that? And by the way, I would put in this caveat, and I think it's incredibly important, mm -hmm. is that you don't call, make one call and, and just start asking for a bunch of stuff. Mm. Like if you come in with, I want this thing, I guarantee mm. you, every, every tourism board is like, oh, you want a free trip? Right. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not how you approach it at all. Mm. If you can, if you can frame it again, this has to do with the framing. If you can mm. come from a place of, I am providing value. Like I, it was easy for me because I honestly believe Americans are supposed to be having passports. So I could approach them from a standpoint of, I want to help promote your company, your country, your mm. company, your hotels, your attractions. Mm. How can we do that together? Mm. Then we're having a different conversation. Mm. And then once I've helped promote them and do things, then all of a sudden we're having a different conversation. Mm. Then, because they already know that I'm happy to promote, because I want you to go to Mexico. I want you to go to Greenland. I want you to go all over the world. And if you're frightened to go to some, you know, to Greenland because you think you're going to be an ice cube, uh, then, you know, go to, go to places that are more well-known, mm. you know. Yeah. Um, go down the more traveled path. Go go down the path that's right for you. Because I guarantee you there is somebody who's going to be discovering Paris for the first time. And they're there, going to want is, to know about it. Is there any way to have this kind of a service automated? Like, so for a coach who wants to, you know, be getting these these free trips, is there any way to have a, a virtual assistant or something like that reaching out to these these different different travel bureaus and stuff like that. Is there any kind of a guide on, on how to do that effectively, consistently over a long period of time? Well, I'm, you know, honestly, I used to teach a course on, mm -hmm. on that and I'm not pitching it in any Let's way now. Share it if you have one. <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, I haven't done it in a while, but, um, you know, of course you can automate it. Of right. course you can hire a person. I think what it comes down to is you have to, before you do anything, you mm -hmm. kind of decide what kind of value can I provide? Mm -hmm. Can I provide it in a reliable and consistent way? Mm -hmm. Can I deliver on my promise in the time that I say that I'm going to provide it? In other words, if they want to know like, oh, you're going to be writing a story. Terrific. When is it going to appear and where is it going to appear? Mm -hmm. If you don't know what the answer is to that, you're dealing with professional people. Yeah. They, they don't want to hear, ah, well, we're working on it. Hmm. <laughs> That's, but I bet you would be amazed at the amount of people who are going to do that. And all they do is kind of clog the system for people who have some sort of a, a general thing. But again, it comes back to how can I develop a relationship and deliver on the things that I say that I'm going to deliver? You might be able to take advantage of somebody once or twice, but your name will spread like wildfire because. Hmm. All of these tourism boards. I mean, part of the reason why I went to Thailand is because I went to uh, Malaysia and Philippines and Singapore first. Mm. And all of those folks, all of the key, the decision makers in those in that universe, they all know each other because they're traveling around the world together in talking about Southeast Asia, as mm. an example. Right. You know what I mean? So yeah. when you're delivering on your stuff, it just gets easier. And, it, you know, I think when you have a genuine desire to be of service, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this whole process becomes easier. Mm -hmm. You know, like travel for free is sort of the salacious thing. Cause right. Everybody <laughs> right. Enough, right. Ooh, how do I travel for free? That's cool. Right. And it is cool. And I want, and I want your audience to have that, mm -hmm. but it's important to be mindful of what the reality of this stuff is. 
So if you want that thing, then it becomes, okay, how, how do I be of service mm. to these groups of people? And then when that happens, that's when you're actually opening the door to the reality of what the travel industry can offer. you. Wow. That's amazing. Well, I'm sure people can get more info for you. We'll tell them how to do that at the end. Sure. I do want to shift gears and go into your book and how you, the traveling that you did played into your your book, your book's <laughs> evolution and the process, your mindset about it. Tell, tell us about that journey. Well, you know, my father was a, uh, a liar, a thief, and a con man, mm -hmm. and he was my greatest hero. And his last dying request, according to his seventh wife, was to be to return home, to be scattered off the coast of Cadiz, Spain. He, he was not Spanish. He probably was never in Spain. That's neither here nor there. Um, <laughs> but I, I chose to take him. There was a point where, and obviously this is part of what the uh, a major focus of what the book is, mm -hmm. is that I was going to go bring him to Spain. I was going to go do it anyway. Um, and... What I needed to do is I, I actually reached out to Spain and I said, hey, I want to write some articles for you. I didn't bring up my father. That was probably, you know, maybe a little bit unethical, mm -hmm. but I was absolutely going to be writing stories about Spain. And I, mm -hmm. and I have since done that. And I think it's a wonderful country. Uh, but, you know, when it was all of a sudden, it was like, how am I going to get you to Spain? You know, funding, funding a trip for myself at the time was really not a practical thing to do. So um, I ended up calling up a magazine that I had written for many, many times. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I was actually going to lie to him. And what I ended up doing and making up some cockamamie story. Instead, what I said was, hey, listen, my father is in this jug. And his last request was to, to go to Spain. Do you know anybody in Spain that I can talk to? And so he said, yeah, let me get let me get my Rolodex. And so I ended up speaking with Spain and ironically, or maybe the universe intervened, uh, Spain said, oh, you know, we have this thing going on in Sevilla. We would love for you to attend. Are you interested? And I said, I would be interested, but I have to get to Cadiz. And they're like, that's great, because that's really sort of, you know, uh, all of Cadiz and Sevilla are in, in the state of Andalusia mm. uh, in southern Spain. And I said, great. And they said, well, we want you to do a whole bunch of things. I said, that's terrific. I'm in. And so I took my father and I dragged him around uh, uh, the countryside. And when I first arrived in Cadiz, I literally met with their tourism board. And I said, mi padre es muerto en la bolsa, which means my father is dead in the bag. Um, <laughs> and I told him we needed to have a funeral and that his last request was to have Ave Maria being sung. Mm. And we need, you know, can we do this? And they were like, uh, uh, sure, you nut. Um, <laughs> and then I spent like 10 days driving around Andalusia and going to their uh, uh, Pueblos wow. Blancos, the white villages of Spain. Mm. And uh, eventually I got back. And of course, you read a little bit about the absurdity. But, you know, as you might imagine, really, the story is about um, how do you because Honestly, my father was kind of a ne'er-do-well kind of guy. Yeah. Um, obviously, I dive into that in the book. And I wanted to be just like him. And for a while, I nailed it until I realized it was an unsustainable way of life. And it had nothing to do with really who it was that I wanted to be yeah. and who it was that I was. I didn't have the constitution to live his life. Yeah. Um, and so the story is about... You know, yes, it's about taking him to Spain. Yes, it's about losing to the ashes. And and yes, it's really about how do you continue to uh, love your father when they were wholly imperfect? Mm. How do you love, uh, you know, how do you love the memory of this person and at the same time have to embrace the fact that they were very flawed um, as, as, a, as a human, you know, as a man? Mm. You know, so it's it's you know it's 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 really about a process of my own awakening to being the person that I wanted to be, with having this kind of family history and and in many cases drama floating around in the background. 
I'm curious, how did, um, how did who your father was, how did that affect your self image and, and, you know, like, like who you saw yourself as, and was there like a battle to constantly be one way versus the other? You kind of mentioned it a little bit, but like, tell us a little bit more about, you know, your discovery of yourself as a man. What, what was that process like? And what were some of the challenges with that? Well, it was, it was to be quite frank with you, it was very painful. Yeah. It was a really challenging period. And when I was talking about, you know, drinking booze as a vocation, that was in part because I thought that's what men did. Hmm. I thought, you know, my father was my hero. And his example for me, not across the board, but in many ways was, uh, you know, how much do you drink and how many cigarettes do you smoke and you're carousing and you're out and you may not be all that honest. And uh, being that and the recipient of his unreliability was a painful process. Obviously, you know, it's, it's a book. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a book. So it goes into great depths. And, you know, really, I think at some point I wrote it for the, the pimply faced version of me mm. who's probably going through something similar. No. It is for the version of of me and the millions of other people like me who had challenging and troubling parents. And how do you deal with that? How do you deal with these kind of flawed, you know, my father was really a lovely person in mm-hmm. many, many ways. Mm-hmm. And he was one of 13 children. He was born into poverty on the South side of Chicago. And, you know, he tried to join the army was when he was 15. So he got what he got. And I think he made the best of it based on what he could, Mm -hmm. you know, so I've learned to appreciate that part of it, but you know, a lot of it was just a true, like a ridiculous train wreck, (laughs) you know? So I'm on the one hand saying to like, okay, keep, keep the course young pimply faced kid who is having some challenges with their parents. And really for everybody else, Mm -hmm. I want you to laugh your face off and Mm -hmm. go, Oh my God, is that really what happened? And yeah, the answer is yes, it's beyond ridiculous. So it's this, you know, it's, I think what it is, it's a dance of what we do with our histories. Mm. You know, it's how do we, how do we become the people we were intended to be? Like my father's life, I wanted it, Mm. honestly, because it has great stories attached to it, but it's not, um, it wasn't something that was natural for me. You know, Mm. I think my father became who he was because that's what, that's what he needed to do. Mm. That was his solution to whatever his own frustrations were, you know, and his own issues with his own father. And so, so if, if your dad was alive today and he read the book, what do you think he would say to you? I don't know if he would say anything. He might punch me in my face. <laughs> very hard. I mean, if I'm honest with you, he might, he might punch me. He also might laugh his, his face off. <laughs> You know, because I think, you know, my, he had, he had a great heart. Mm -hmm. Again, I think if he was given opportunities, the way he had given me opportunities, he would like, his life would likely turn out in, in a very different way, Mm -hmm. but it was what it was, you know? Um, So I, I'm hoping that he can see that my criticism wasn't about punishing him Mm -hmm. It was about um, attempting to understand him at the different phases of my life when I was trying to understand him. And I didn't have the brains Mm. to see the deeper, the deeper meanings or what his own challenges were, you know? So I think, I think if I could get him to read the whole book, (laughs) I I think he would, I think he'd be really happy. But he might read the first four pages and go, you know what, you little MF. (laughs) What do you, you know. what do you think he would be most proud about you for? Um, oh, that's a tough one. You know, honestly, I made so many mistakes. Mm. I, I kind of like to say that I have, I have failed my way to success and I don't know how I did it, but I lead, I lead a pretty good life. Mm. I, I'd like to believe that I'm pretty authentic. Like, I think this is kind of, you know, what you get with me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think he would appreciate that. I, I think he would respect me. Mm. I think he would respect me. He may not uh, agree with you know some of the things that I say and do, but I think he would respect me as 
as a guy who really, you know, who, who's really tried to uh, turn his life around and, and sort of like make good. I, I think he would respect that. But he could be wrong. So <laughs> it's, it's, you know, you, you never know, right? Yes. Well, I'm sure he's proud of you and does respect you. And I'm sure he would read the book too, because like you put your, your heart and soul into it, man. And uh, let's let's start wrapping up and, and just final takeaways for our audience so that they, they can really receive the, the message, the ethos of who you are and what you're about in the world. Um. Well, I mean, I, I think what it is, is at some point, I believe that love is an action and that action mm. is service. Mm. So I try to uh, not worry about the nonsense that I get. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, what am I? I don't I try not to take action with the mind of, well, secretly, if I do this thing, then I'll people will pat me on the back. <laughs> and I think that's just a, a path to sort of like a false modesty. Yeah. And, and I think. Uh, the more I take me out of the equation, I think the more happy, content, and more uh, genuine purpose I feel in my life, which I think is all like, like all those things jumbled together, give me hope. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's probably the main crux of it. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Awesome. 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 Oh. So it, it, am I, am I allowed to kind of plug the book? Like, please? Yeah. I was going to say, how do people stay connected with you? What do we want them to do next? Oh, well they can go to Devin forward slash dad D a D. Uh, and, uh, that will give you, uh, a, that'll give you a little bit more on the book. It'll tell you where to get it, which is kind of all the usual things, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, mm-hmm. uh, indie bound is a fantastic thing to support local bookstores. Um, and, uh, what was the other thing? Oh, and so it'll also give you, if you buy my book, I'm going to give you free stuff because I have a bunch of uh, uh, fun uh, marketing things with friends that are joining in. As a matter of fact, I would love to have you participate as well. Awesome. Um, and so you can just get some free stuff as well that that will hopefully change your life. Beautiful. I'm sure it will. Definitely. And Devin, dude, thank you for capturing your journey in written form for the pimply faced younger version of yourself <laughs> to, to have some kind of guide or source of inspiration uh, for whatever he is going through or whatever anyone is going through on this journey called life. And I love how you're so, so empowering around the frame. What's the frame that we take things with uh, and take and look at life through? What's the value that we're adding? Let's start with that. Let's start with being of service. And uh, love is definitely an action. Love is, is definitely through service. You know, you you got to, you get to, we get to show it and uh, you're definitely showing the world that you love it man and we, we appreciate you being on here one one final thought Chris yeah is that I really love what you're doing thank you. I think what you're doing is uh, I think it's good work thank I you. think it's what I think you being out here uh, and dedicating yourself to transformation and and sort of like doing more I think is a wonderful thing thank you Thank you, Devin. We appreciate you. I appreciate you. Have the best day ever, and we'll see you soon, okay? Thanks, Chris. All right, take care.